Welcome to week two of Adventure Awaits. I'm excited you guys are here. I'm excited to be here. I, I actually like adventure, most adventure, not all adventure. My husband and I, we like different adventures. He's probably more Indiana Jones, and I'm probably more Mega Mall, you know, in Indianapolis or whatever, wherever that, 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 with the roller coaster, you know that one? Um, but, you know, when you've been married 27 years, you learn to take adventures. We're in this adventure together. But there really is one adventure that I really love not doing. I really, really, like really, really love not camping. Like not camping. I'm just somebody else who shares my same heart about this activity that seems to be so popular, at least with my husband. So watch this video for me. I thought we were going on vacation this summer. Nope, we're going camping. Crazy long car ride, dangerous animals, and brothers, ew, disgusting. You know why would you call this a sleeping bag? It's gonna put bags under your eyes by morning. <laughs> Sit five hours to catch a fish, then throw right back. I'm not hooked. Kayak, one of makes me yak. <laughs> You'd hope you able to take a hike as an Enzo, right? <laughs> if you can carry your house in a dying bag, it's not safe. When I camp, I look up the beautiful stars and imagine how nice it would be to have Wi-Fi in a shower. <laughs> Ultimately, I think my parents want me to be more appreciative. Wake up television and the internet, right? By the way, there was HBO. Horrendous body odor. <laughs> that is how I feel about camping. I agree with her. I love that we have the same heart for things, me and that cute little girl. You know, when Kelly and I got married, we, we took two family, family vacations, like right away. And I was never one to get to go on family vacations growing up. I didn't really have a lot of experience with vacation. So when he says vacation, I'm excited. However, our two first vacations were to Colorado, which again, I'm excited. I've never been, I'm anxious to see it. The first time we went, he, um, we went with the family, the whole family, and we rented a motor home. So basically, we drove this mini house on wheels up into the mountains, and I was car sick the whole time. Like that, well, I've, car, I've gotten sick in a kayak too. I get sick easily, and it was, that part of it was just so miserable. So the next year rolls around, and Kelly's like, listen, I love Colorado. I need you to love Colorado with me. So we're gonna go again. Okay, so we're not taking the house on wheels. Nope, not taking the house on wheels. We're gonna drive there. And we're not sleeping in a tent. Nope, I'm not gonna sleep in a tent. I'm gonna, we're gonna stay in a cabin. And I'm like, a cabin. Okay, I got this. He's like, it's a little bit rustic. I'm like, okay, I can appreciate rustic. I like Joanna Gaines. I see some of the things that she does. It's like, well, it's a little bit really rustic. Oh, okay. It's probably like what? Quilts and mismatched pillowcases and things, right? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay, so we arrive at the cabin that's way up in the mountains, and it's, um, it's, it's way up in the mountains on a skinny road that, that you like have to drive really slow or you'll fall off a cliff kind of skinny road, and you get up in the cabins. Now, we get to this cabin that has um, no electricity. It's rustic, right? There is no electricity in this cabin, none, which means there's no heat at night when it's 20 degrees in Colorado. There's no air conditioning in the cold when it actually pops back up to 80 degrees. There's no way to heat up water or take hot showers. None of that exists in this rustic cabin. So it has no electricity. It has um, no, no um, indoor plumbing facilities. It has no interior toilet, none in it. Okay, so you say, okay, it's an outhouse, all right? How bad could it be? 
let me tell you how bad it could be. Because I had a, a, almost three-year-old, I had 11-month-old twins, and I was seven months pregnant with the fourth one on their way. And he tells me in this rustic family vacation that I have to trek out a mountain 20 yards to get to an outhouse in the middle of the night on this like windy path. It's overgrown with weeds and snakes are there and it's bug infested. And I'm going to get to the outhouse in the middle of the night. I'm like, no, this is a vacation. This is torture. What are you doing to me? So in Callie, Callie's here, our oldest daughter, when she was, you know, just a, she was the oldest one, not quite three. And when she wakes up in the morning and she needs to get her some milk because she asks for a glass of milk, I'm like, okay, Callie, come with me. This is what we have to do. We're going to go out the front door. We're going to walk on this dirt path all the way out to the front of our rustic cabin. It's about 20, 20, 200 yards away. I don't know. It's a long ways. We walk out there. When we get out there, we're going to find the brown rope that's on the ground. And when we find the brown rope, we're going to reel it in because that's what your milk is connected to, hanging out in the stream in front of our rustic cabin in Colorado, because that is the way you keep your food cold when you're there. Okay, who are my adventure seekers here? Anybody? Anyone? Anyone willing? You can go with him next summer. He'll take you if you want to see it, but not me. That's not exactly the type of thing that I signed up for. But this is what we know with the adventure when it comes to Jesus. It might not be or look like the exact adventure that we signed up for. But on the other side of what he is is wanting us to do is the most amazing adventure of your life. It might throw you off a little bit. It might have completely definitions of different definitions of rustic, but still yet. That is where the ultimate adventure for your life is found. When I was was pregnant with the twins, an interesting thing was happening when um, not long before they were born. They uh, they labeled them baby A, baby B, baby girl, baby boy. We knew we were having a girl and a boy. um, But then they always said, now baby girl, she's going to come first. She's first. You know, their heads are like right here. And they're like, okay, she's going to come first. Now, when it was close to being time to give birth to the twins, it, it was as if I was giving birth to like an a octopus that drank espresso like five times a day or something. I mean, it was just all of this going on in my stomach. It was just crazy. I was so excited to finally give birth to these twins. We're going to go and we're going to go to the hospital and it's going to be like, here we are. Here we are. We're here. So we get to the hospital, and when the twins are being born, and, um, and I, I, I give birth, and they're like, congratulations, it's a boy. And I'm like, no, the girl is first. You always told me the girl is first. Oh, no, don't let me have two boys. No, 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 that's not what I'm prepared for. But it was like, yep, nope, Braxton, he's here. And this is what happened. After Braxton was born, it's as if his twin sister, Brooklyn, after all that time that they had to share that cramped space, it's like she decided that she was not going on this adventure with him. She, she instead turned, turned her head forward, stuck her feet out, and was like, nope, nope, I'm good here. I'm comfortable. I'm going to stay in place. And she went the wrong direction. She literally went the wrong direction. Okay, I want to show you something in Scripture that gives us an example of where there was a man who was face-to-face with Jesus. On the other side of this conversation is the greatest adventure that he could go on, and this is the reaction that he, he gave. So this is in Luke chapter 18. I'm reading from the NIV, and I'm starting in verse 18. And it said, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. And he says, all of these things I have kept 
Since I was a boy, he said, I've been doing all the right things that, that I've been taught to do, that I'm supposed to do, that I believe I am supposed to be doing. Then it says, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. You still lack one thing. I, I love the way it's, it reads in the Passion Translation as well. And this is the Bible that I'm reading through this year. And I love how the, the words are just putting a few different pictures in my mind. But it says, when the wealthy leader replied, these are the very things that I've been doing for as long as I can remember. I've been following your ways. I've been following the plan that you have for me. I've been going down that road. And, and, and Jesus replies, ah, Jesus said, but there is still one thing missing from your life is what it says here. One thing missing from your life. You know, what if you were um, face-to-face with someone that was promising you the one thing that you needed to hear? Like, uh, you will have complete success in your career if you do just this one thing, and it's guaranteed. It cannot fail if you'll just do the one thing that I'm telling you. You can drop 15 pounds, and it'll never come back onto your body if you do just this one thing. It's just one thing. That's all you have to do. Your relationship will be a complete success if you do just this one thing. What would you do? Do you want to hear what the one thing is? I mean, I want to know what the 15-pound thing is. I'm listening. Tell me this one thing that I need to know. Would you be like, "Mm, I don't know, maybe? No. No. When it's just the one thing that you need to hear, you're going you're gonna to lean in. You're going to sit on the edge of your seat and be like, tell me, tell me what this one thing is that I need to know. Up in um, our Wednesday night women's group up in class, just this last Wednesday night, we were talking about weight loss and the conversation come up that, that um, did, did you know that you can freeze your fat and it goes away forever? I mean, that's what they say, that you can do it. They suction a little bit out, it freezes. After a certain amount of time, it's gone. And I'm like, well, it, you're, you like this muffin top that you've had forever over your jeans, gone forever. All you got to do is freeze it, and it's gone. And I'm like, well, okay, tell me, what is something like this, what does this cost? And they, I mean, it was crazy. It was like $2,000 or 2500 But I remember in that moment of this conversation thinking, well, I mean, it could be possible. I don't know. Like, maybe I could come up. I don't know. You know, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, in my mind, I, numbers were ticking, and I'm seeing frozen things just disappearing off my body. And <laughs> it would have been a totally different story if we're having this conversation about something. And, and I'm like, well, how much does it cost? And they said $20,000, but it's guaranteed. You don't have to worry about it ever again. I would have thought, well, there's no way. I mean, there's just no way. I wouldn't have even like been like, hmm, I wonder, can I figure this out? Can I move this around? Is my husband going to miss the money? No. I've never even like been in possession of $20,000. $2,000, I've kind of seen it come and go in a month with bills. But the other, I just immediately, if, if you had told me that, I would have been like, there's absolutely no way that it could, it could happen for my life. So, With Jesus, let's look here what happened. He's talking with this man. What is it, Lord? What is the one thing that I'm missing from my life? And he says this. You must go and sell everything you own. Give all the proceeds to the poor so you will have eternal treasures. Then you come and follow me. When the rich leader heard these words, he was devastated. He was Sad, the NIV translation says. I read another translation that says he was even angry. The thing is, is he's setting himself up. He's been following the plan, the path, all of these things since he was a boy, the scripture says. So now he's ready for more. I'm ready for the next thing, God. What is the one thing that you need me to, what is is it that I'm lacking? Just tell me, he's saying, just the one thing. But you can tell by the way he reacted, devastation, sadness. The only 
same reason that reaction happens in our life is because we're so surprised by the answer we just heard. We know there is just no way. There's no way. It's $20,000. There's no way it's going to happen. And in that moment, he knew. It said he had great wealth. It was not the answer that he was expecting in his life. And in that moment, he, he absolutely knew. You know, does this mean that this greatest adventure that we're trying to go on with Jesus, this one thing that we need means that we have to give away all our money, sell everything that we have and give it to the poor? Is that what it's saying? I mean, for some of us, it wouldn't really be that hard. I don't, I don't have great wealth. As a matter of fact, when Braxton and Brooklyn were born, we didn't even own them until they went to kindergarten. Like, not fully. We were paying for them for five years. And then, you know, there were, it's like, they don't, no take backs, no refund policy. You just got to pay them off. And so we didn't own them. I've never had great wealth. I mean, if you said, okay, for the teenagers in the room, if I said, okay, to get the one thing, the adventure that Jesus wants to take you on, all you have to do is give all the money you have. Is that really a sacrifice for everybody in the room? You know what? My bank account has 22 cents, you know, whatever. It's just not that much. It would be like, okay, well, you know, sure, I got this. Let's go. Let's do it, Lord. Let's do it. It would be different for you if he's looking at you and telling you the one thing that you can't imagine removing from your life. It's the one thing. You see, what we learn from the, the ruler here is that he's not, he's not after your money. That's not what he wants. He's after the competition in your heart that is taking place of truly following the adventure that he has for you. You see, we all have it, some kind of a competition that is in our heart. And if we're going to go on this adventure with Jesus, the one that he so wants each and every one of us to walk out and walk it out well, then we're going to have to get rid of the competition that we have in our heart. I love this when I, when I, saw, um, I, I saw it written down in the footnotes, and it says the, the disciple, Jesus knew that he couldn't truly be his disciple until there was no competition in his heart to follow him. No competition. And I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it is your wealth. Maybe it is your money. I don't know. But what is it that rises up in you that keeps you from thinking, well, there is just, there's just no way that I could do that. What if, what if God spoke to Tony and said, okay, you're doing all these things amazing. I love how you're leading worship. You're moving in my spirit. You're doing all these things. But listen, Tony, I need you to lay down your guitar and I need you to not sing again. And that is when I need you to come follow me and do this instead. Can you imagine how heart crushing that would be? This thing that you knew that you were doing and doing well. I find it hard to believe that this, this man who was wealthy, who said he, he followed all, he, he wasn't murdering, he went all the things that he knew and was following. I, it's hard to believe that God wasn't blessing him in his endeavors to give him that wealth. But at some point in our life, it becomes a competition to us. And we don't really, we don't really want to notice it sometimes because we know that God is moving in our life. We know that he is. But the only reason you have that reaction when God is telling you to do something and you're not feeling and you're surprised and you're devastated and you're sad is because in your heart you think, well, there's no way I could do that. God, I can't do that for you. I cannot do that. That feels like it would be impossible. You know, when Brooklyn, when Brooklyn stretched out, when the twins were born and Brooklyn, you know, took her little like nap, moved around and stretched out and got herself comfortable instead of coming into the world like she was supposed to, she, she not only did that, but she also, as that was happening, she took something from her brother. You see, we like to take 
when we, we want to stay in a place, we like to take what we need to be comfortable. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that's unique to twins, and it's called a, a twin-to-twin transfusion. And so when one twin is born, another twin will pull from their blood through the umbilical cord, and they'll hold on to it. And so then the one that's born is, doesn't have quite enough blood. So shortly after he was born, he stopped breathing, and then there were all these problems, and that's why we paid for them for five years. Because Brooklyn decided to get a little bit comfortable and take from her brother instead of coming into the world. But that is what we do. That's what we saw that this man did in Scripture. Instead of moving forward and doing that one thing, he instead took what he needed to be comfortable, which was his wealth, and decided to stay with that instead. So I have to ask, are we paying attention to the one thing Is there the one thing? I think we all have it in our life. Some of us, we already know what it is. It's already aware that there's something in your life that's that's pulling at you, that is competing for God's time with you, that is pulling away your heart in a different direction. Some of us, maybe we don't know because maybe we haven't asked. But if Jesus was in front of you asking you this question or you asked him this question, he would tell you the one thing that's causing the competition in your heart. He would tell you what it is if you just simply ask. You see, it's not gonna be as obvious to us if we're not willing to ask. It's not like looking in a mirror where you can see everything, especially like a high-powered mirror. I have a high-powered mirror. Like when I look at it and it even has a light, I can see it all, see everything. I don't like what I see, and oftentimes I just want to walk away. I see spots. I see wrinkles. I I see chin hair that are growing at the pace of my husband's. And I'm like, Lord, honestly, what's happening here? I'm thinking about like pulling a Samson and Delilah and shaving you in the middle of the night and seeing if that stops my hair from growing. I don't know. It'd be worth a try because really, but those things are obvious. I'm looking right at it. Your heart, nobody else can see in there and tell you what it is. You can't really look in a mirror and see your heart. The way to understand if there's any competition in your heart that's rising up in the place of the adventure that Jesus wants to take you on is to ask him. Because when you ask, he will tell you what it is. You might not love the answer, but your job is to listen and say, whatever it is, God, whatever it is, no matter what, whatever it is, it's the one thing that you need that will cause you success no matter what. You know, there, so you say, well, what do we do? What do we do? How do I, how do I, how do I do this one thing when it's, it, the competition is fierce? And I've got a simple solution to this one thing, to being able to walk it out with courage. Number one, you do have to ask what it is. If you're not asking, that's the problem. You're just moving around doing your thing as if there's no one thing in the way. At some point, God is going to make you aware of it in a painful way or just ask him. He wants to show you what it is. But the one way that you can be successful at getting past it and moving forward is to make sure that you're not going solo. You cannot go alone. You see, with this wealthy ruler that we talked about, I have no idea, we don't know who was with him, what his family was like, who was surrounding him. We don't know what that looked like. We don't get that part of the story. So I wonder if when he heard that news, what if he knows back at home he has a wife and and kids to feed? What if he he has a grumpy wife at home? What if when he goes home and he's going to tell his wife what he did, she's going to say, what? Are you kidding? You did what? All of it? All of it? How are we supposed to eat? What are we going to do? How are we going to live? I can't believe that. You go. Go get it back. You go get it back right now. Tell him you made a mistake. We can't do that. That's crazy. But I wonder sometimes if we make it even that dramatic in our life. When we hear something from the Lord, when we get that nudge, that thing that we want to do, but instantly we think, well, it's impossible. There's just no way. Are you surrounding yourself with the right people that allow you to think differently? That's the key. When you start feeling some doubt, you've got the right people in place that can say, yeah, 
I believe it. Well, it's not impossible. You can do it. You have it, it, it matters who you're surrounding yourself with. It matters so very much. When our youngest son was playing basketball, he was a high school basketball player, and um, and he, when he would play and he would get, uh, he would do something wrong. He would fail. He would make a bad play. Something would happen, and you could instantly see it on his face. You knew he was disappointed, and you also knew what was coming because it happened every time. Failed play, you could look over at the coach, and then there would the coach, go in! Oh, he would do. Coaches do that all the time on the sideline. Oh, like, I told you not to do that. Why are you out there doing that again? And every time, there's something within me in this mom's heart that would rise up and be like, not my son. Don't you come after my son. You can't yell at him. But you see, Kelson, he'd, he'd walk off the court, and he'd get in front of the coach, and the coach would be telling him his thing. And, you know, he'd, he'd put the next person in, and, and Kelson would go to sit down, and, and, and kids would just kind of make a spot, and he would sit. But the interesting thing happened every time that that happened, when he would fail and he would get it from the coach and he would go and he would sit down in his seat, the person on his right would tap him on the shoulder. The person on his left would do this. Someone would reach over from the sidelines and be like, you're doing a good job. Every time, the people that were surrounding him as his team were saying, you're doing good. The coach is just doing his job. He's telling you the one thing that you need to get out there and do. And when you don't get it quite right, there are people surrounding you that say, hey, I'm with you. We can do this. We're a team, right? We're in this together. We're not supposed to be going solo here. Braxton and Brooklyn were supposed to be on the journey together. They weren't supposed to be born 45 minutes apart like they were. They were supposed to be born two minutes apart. And there's a long journey But she made it. She arrived into the world. And you will too. You see, it's never too late for that one thing that God wants you to do. If you are alive and living and have breath in your body, then you have the one thing that he wants you to do still in front of you at all times, at every time. I know for myself, I am always fighting that competition in my heart. For me, it looks like fear. It looks like fear. It feels like fear. And fear deeply rooted in failure. What if I fail at that? What if I'm not any good? I don't know. Second guessing. It's always right there. But do you know what I've learned to do? I've learned to surround myself with people that know that about me. That's the thing about not going alone. Not only do you have to have people surrounding you, but they got to know something about you. they got to know what's going on in your life because you are not meant to get to the end of this road and arrive in front of Jesus and be like, oh, here I am. You know, I made it. I did all the things. I didn't murder. I didn't commit adultery. I didn't steal. Here I am, God. And he's saying, but that one thing, What about that one thing? I needed you to do that one thing so you know what? So that you would not arrive here solo. You guys, that's what it is. It's all about not getting somewhere solo. We should make it up to -to face-to-face with Jesus in heaven someday and not be like, here I am, but get up there and, and, and get in front of him and be like, here we are. Here we are. All of us, don't go by yourself. You take people with you when you're doing the one thing and you're doing it well. So we cannot let that competition, you can come up and, and play, whoever wants to come up and play, I'm, gonna, I'm finishing up here. We cannot let that competition that is just rising in our heart, that's fighting for space. So usually you find yourself in one of two places. Like I said, you either immediately know what it is. You know what's distracting you. I don't know, sometimes it's a relationship, if it's your kids, maybe you have your kids in a lot of sports activities and that is just taking you way away from the path that God had for your family. I don't know what it is. It could look so different for each and every one of us. As a matter of fact, it's not supposed to be the same. For some, it could be finances, it could be your career. Whatever it is, you either know it and if you don't, then it's time for you to ask that question. It's time for you to say, God, 
Lord. Show me the one thing. Is there something that's fighting for competition in my heart that is keeping me from following every adventure that you want me to go on? The greatest adventure of our life is with Jesus. The greatest adventure. But I tell you what, he has something for each and every one of us to do that if you hear it on your own, you will walk away sad. You'll, you'll, you'll hear that from the Lord and feel it and think that's what you're supposed to do and you're going to be devastated unless you have the right people in place around you. What if this ruler, instead of a grumpy wife that he might have had at home, was, was surrounded with a group of people that said, he said, what? Really? Oh, I believe you can do it. I'm with you. Hey, I'll go with you. I'll do that too. Let's go. We can do this together. Together. We're in this church all together. We're on the same team. All across the city of Tulsa, churches are gathered together today, bringing people to Jesus, worshiping the Lord on the same team. All across the state of Oklahoma, we're gathered together with all the other United States on the same team gathered together, reaching the world for Jesus on the same team. It's not a solo sport. Go together. Don't go on your own. You guys, it's so hard because it takes a, a place within us willing to be vulnerable and uncomfortable. But don't put your feet out and say no and then shrink back and take what you need to be comfortable. Arms wide open in an act of worship, in an act of asking, Ask him what could be in that spot. You guys stand with me. I want to say a prayer over you today. I just want to, I want to pray this. I just want to pray that if you know what it is, that today is your day that you have courage to just do it, to step, to believe, to trust, to pull somebody in your life, whatever it is that you need. And I want to pray this if you don't, if you're not sure if there's anything that's in the way, that you have the courage to ask. And then when you do, you accept whatever you begin to understand about what God has for your life and accept it with a faith and believe it because you've got people surrounding you that will believe it with you, right?